Well, good morning. morning. Here we are again, another week has passed, gathered in God's house, and it's good to be here. God's blessed us with another week of beautiful weather here in Alberta, southern Alberta, and we thank Him for that, and just to see the sun rise every morning is a gift from God. Every day of life is a gift from our Creator. If you're visiting with us this morning watching, welcome to you, we're glad that you could join us today as we worship our God. I'd like to read from Revelation 5, John's vision into heaven, what the Holy Spirit gave him to see, he saw, this is part of what he saw, he goes, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept, because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. And one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And before the throne were a multitude of saints and angels, and they sang a new song to the Lamb. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Of course, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb, who was slain is Jesus Christ. He was able to open the scrolls, God's will, God's word, and on how creation will continue after the Lord returns. God's great redemption plan sealed in that scroll, fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and we're here to celebrate that, what Jesus Christ has done, and to thank God and praise Him that Jesus was found worthy to open the scroll and to make us children of God that he purchased through his own shed blood, that we are a kingdom and priests to serve our God, not only today in this world, in this life, but in the life to come if our faith is in the Lord Jesus. So let's stand together when the music plays and let's sing our opening songs. The first one, Lion of Judah.
God receive a greeting from God that comes from Revelation as well. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of earth. Amen. Let's sing Be the Center. We'll follow that with the refrain of Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. course, we can only read about what John saw when he looked into heaven. He had that vision that God provided him. We can put a picture in our mind of what Jesus looks like sitting on his throne as the Lion of Judah, the Lamb who was slain but who conquered. And as we chorus of Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus reminds us, we need to keep our 
eyes, our mind, our hearts fixed on the Lord. That may be a hard thing to do in theory and concept, but when we focus on Jesus as God reveals Him in the Word, in the Bible, and as God, the Spirit, reveals Him to our hearts, we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus in that way by putting our time and attention on things that relate to Him, spending time in worship, uh, reading His Word, praying to Him. That's how we fix our eyes on Jesus. And when we do that, when we keep our eye on Jesus, we'll find that in our lives we sin less than we normally do. I'd like to read from Ephesians chapter 1 about who God is creating us to be in Christ. Paul writes, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. I'll turn to God in a moment of prayer, confessing that we don't keep our eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus, and when we turn our eyes from him onto the things of the world, that's when we trip up, that's when we fall short of living how God wants us to as his children, we commit sin. But we continually turn back to Jesus, relying on his finished work on the cross and over the grave to find the forgiveness that we so desperately need and desire. So let's do that. Let's turn to God in prayer, confessing our sins before him. We thank you, Lord God, our God and Father, that you have made us your children in Jesus Christ. If you give us faith to believe that Jesus has paid the price for our sin, and you put it on our hearts to seek to follow him as best we can, we know that we find that forgiveness through his shed blood. We thank you, Lord, for the riches of your grace that you lavish on us over and over, day by day. We thank you, Lord, that even in those persistent sins and temptations that we give into, we find forgiveness in Jesus. And so, Lord, in this prayer, we ask that you would bring to light those sins that we need to fight against, the things that we've excused that displease you, the things that we no longer count as sin, but that your word clearly tells us is not what Christians should be doing, how they should be living. So convict us, Lord, that we would turn to your throne, we would fall on our knees before the cross, confess our sins and leave them there, because Jesus has indeed paid for them already. And so, put us back on our feet, that we may go out to serve you more and more each day, in a Christ-like way that grows as we grow, to know him more, to follow him better, to give our lives to him more completely. Holy Spirit, only you can make this happen in us. It's not a feat that we accomplish on our own. It's only through your power, through your voice leading and guiding us, that we will become more like Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Remain seated as we sing. His mercy is more. No matter how often we sin, and how far we fall short, God's mercy is great enough to cover everything that we do that is wrong before his eyes. So let's sing this song as a song of assurance and be reminded that God's mercy is endless for those who love the Lord Jesus Christ. No. 
turn back to Ephesians, this time chapter 2, verses 4 through 10 as our call to Christian living. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. What are those good works? Well, we find out what they are by reading God's Word, by looking to Jesus, by living as Jesus lived. For Jesus is the perfect human being, and He is the one that we set our sights on. For that is, for He is the one that God is making us to be like. By God's grace and the Holy Spirit's work, that happens more and more each day. Let's stand together when the music plays and we'll sing The Power of the Cross. We usually sing this just around Easter, but such a good song reminds us of what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. So let's sing it today and bless the Lord as we do so. Let's stand together and sing The Power of the Cross.
any kids pre-K to grade one, including grade one, can come down to the front or join the kids on the way out. Go off to Sunday school in just a moment. Okay. You work that out with dad? Yeah. Sunday school? Well, okay, well, I know you worked that out with your dad. I trust that you made the right decision. Okay, and then if you stay here and you end up wanting to go upstairs to Sunday school, you can do that too. All right? Okay. We're going to bless the children. We'll pray first and then bless the children. So let's do that. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you before we read your word and spend some time studying it. Whether we're here in the sanctuary or up in Sunday school, Lord, we open your Bible to read about you and to read about how much you love us, to read about Jesus and to be reminded of his great love that sent him to the cross. We thank you that we could sing that gospel story through the song, The Power of the Cross, O to See the Dawn. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we are your children, whether we're young or old, that through faith in you, you are our everlasting Father, our Prince of Peace, our King, and our Lord. And we look that to you to draw us closer unto yourself through the work of the Holy Spirit as we study the Bible now. It's, and, uh, just bless us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so now you guys can stand up and face the people. All right. We're going to say the Lord be with you. Do you remember what you have to say in response? And also with you, okay? So uh, let's see if everybody can say that, all of you guys, okay? So let's bless the children saying, the Lord be with you. Yeah, pretty good. Most of you said it, I think. All right, you keep practicing that. Next week we'll do it again. Okay, but now you can go off to Sunday school. All right, we'll see you in a bit. <clears throat> For those of us staying here in the sanctuary, I invite you to turn to two passages. James, of course, as we go through James. We turn back to James chapter 4. Page 1884 in the Pew Bible. We're also going to read Matthew 7 verses 1 through 5. As I've said a few times, I'm pretty sure, going through James, that a lot of what James teaches, he bases on what he heard Jesus, his brother, the Lord, teach. That's partly why we turn to Matthew 7. So why don't we read Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5 first, and then we'll go to James. So Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. That's on page 1505 in the Pew Bible, 1505. <clears throat> These are words from Jesus Christ, um, contained in what we commonly call his Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And now we turn to James 4. Let's read verses 10 through 12. 
Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will lift you up. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So last week, we looked at how James was discussing our relationship with the Lord in verses 4 through 10, chapter 4. He talked first about our praying to God and how we need to examine the motive behind why we pray and what we pray for. And then he moved on to how we treat the Lord, how we see our relationship to the Lord. James asked, are we chasing after and being friendly with the world like unfaithful spouses? One reason that we don't honor our relationship with God is because we think too highly and too much about ourselves. At times we act as though God owes us, or we act as though God answers to us. We act as though we're on par with God. And to correct this behavior, James says in verse 7, submit to the Lord. We need to be humble before our God, and why is that? That's because He is God and we are not. That's because He is the Creator and we are the creature. It's because He is holy and righteous, and we are sinners. Saved sinners, but still sinners nonetheless. Now in verse 11, James shifts back to how we speak about other people. But taken as a whole, chapters 3 and 4 are about how we relate to others in the body of Christ. And how we treat one another in the church directly relates to our relationship with the Lord. Our relationship to the Lord determines how we will treat other people. In chapter 3, James speaks of what happens when we don't tame our tongues. He says the tongue can make great boasts. He also says that the tongue starts many fires. Our words matter and they come ultimately from out of our hearts. And the state of our relationship with the Lord determines the state of our hearts. So here in verse 11, he gives us an example of what happens when our tongues are not tamed. He says we slander others within the family of God. To slander another person is to attack their character, their personhood. And One reason we slander others is because we believe that we are superior to them. And we think that way, that we're superior because of our our relationship to God, it gets warped. If we fall into the temptation to take God out of number one position in our lives, then we will certainly treat other people as less than us. We slander others to reduce their character, to reduce their profile in order to raise our image up. Slander is using words to burn other people down. And boasting is using words to build ourselves up. At the beginning of chapter 4, James asks the Christians that he writes to, what causes quarrels and fights among you? He answers his own question with, you want stuff, but you don't get it. Greed, jealousy, and envy, they lead to quarrels and fighting. Greed, jealousy, and envy also lead to slanderous talk about one another. We want what other Christians have, but we don't get it. So then, sometimes our response is to attack them to reduce their enjoyment of what they have, to reduce their character. We think they're no better than me to have what they have, so I'll make them pay. Slandering others can come from thinking that we are victims of injustice. And so to right a perceived wrong, then we slander and malign those who have what we don't have. Slander is killing another person's image and character. And that's likely what James intends when he says in verse four, uh, verse 2 of chapter 4, you want something but don't get it, you kill and covet. The killing that he's talking about is not physical murder. It's character assassination that we are guilty of when we slander other people. And slander and gossip in the family kills the family. 
backbiting between family members, it leaks out into the public, it's, and slander then stains the family image. Slander and gossip in a Christian community, it also kills the family of Jesus Christ as well. Backbiting and critical talk by Christians about Christians, it leaks into the public. Slander among Christians stains the image of the family of Christ. Slander among Christians, it bruises and it bloodies the body of Jesus Christ. Now, gossip is a form of slander. Slander and gossip, they cut other people down. Boasting, that's the opposite side of the coin to slander. Where slander cuts someone down, boasting puffs the self up. And the Bible warns against both of these sins, on treating others poorly and elevating ourselves in a disingenuous way. Slander and boasting often result from a sinful superiority complex. And a superiority complex means that we're number one in our hearts. We are our heart's desire. And if that's true, if we're our heart's desire, then again our relationship to the Lord is warped and twisted. The opposite of a sinful superiority complex is submission. To fight slander and boasting, we need an attitude of humility and submission. That's what James has been talking about, submit to the Lord. If we are humble and submissive, then God will be number one in our lives and in our hearts. And if we're humble and submissive to God, then we will see others not as less than us. We'll see them as equal to us in God's eyes. And so it's very critical that we see God and others properly, and that requires humility, a spirit of humbleness. Humility working in us says, or causes us to say, I'm not, I am not better than others. Humility says, I am a sinner just like everyone else. Humility says, I am in need of God's grace and forgiveness just like everybody. In verse 6, James reminds his readers of the wisdom that's found in the Proverbs. He quotes Proverbs by saying, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humility and submission, they are critical to proper Christian living, which is James's goal, to get the Christians to live like Christ. So a humble and submissive heart, that is also vital to having a Christ-like attitude and character. Our Lord Jesus modeled a humble and submissive spirit. And the well-known passage in Philippians 2 describes Christ's life of submission and humility. Just like James, Paul writes about our selfishness, our vanity, our pride. And then Paul describes Christ's attitude as the antidote to our overinflated view of who we are. Because Christ is our example, let's hear that passage from Philippians 2 again. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Being perfectly sinless, Jesus was indeed better and superior than all other human beings. But Jesus didn't go around bragging and boasting about himself. And Jesus certainly didn't go around pointing out people's faults in order to highlight his own perfection. That's because Jesus had a right relationship with the Father, as that passage describes. If we are Jesus' people, then we must not go around bragging about ourselves either. And we must not go around pointing out people's faults to highlight our supposed goodness. Humility counteracts selfish ambition and vain conceit. Humility leads us to consider others as better than ourselves. And if we do that, seeing others better than ourselves, we won't cut them down with slanderous talk. In fact, if we see them as better than us, we will talk them up, not talk them down. Back to Philippians 2, Jesus took on flesh and was found in appearance as a man, Paul writes. And as a man, he humbled himself before God. The sinless Jesus honored the creator-creature relationship. In his created manhood, 
He knew God was here, and he was here. Because he was humble and submissive, Jesus died for sinners who deserve God's judgment. And so Jesus not only humbled himself before God, he humbled himself before other human beings. And We'll get to the judgment part of our text in just a moment. But Jesus sets the pattern, as always, for us to follow. Jesus, the perfect, sinless human, he died for others because of his love for them. We talked about that, we sang about that already this morning. Jesus fulfilled God's law of love because he was humble and submissive. God is calling each one of us as his children to do the same. We are to be like Christ in how we treat God and others. That means treating God as Lord and King and treating others as better than ourselves, as people worth dying for. Jesus summed up the proper way to treat God and neighbor as the way of love. And he said we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. The only way to fulfill God's commands to live a life of love is with a humble and submissive spirit. Pride will prevent us from fulfilling God's law. James says slandering others happens when we judge other people. What we do is we judge them to be beneath us. Our pride, our vain conceit, cause us to judge other Christians as less than who we are. In our minds, we say things like, or to other people, we say things like, did you hear what so-and-so did? Can you believe how bad they are? Aren't they awful? I'd never do that. When we slander others like this, we're not obeying God's law to love our neighbor. James says when we slander, we speak against the law and we judge it. What law is James talking about? He's talking about the royal law, the one that he spoke of in chapter 2, verse 8. He's speaking about God's law to love your neighbor as yourself. So when we slander other Christians, in effect we are saying they don't deserve to be loved or treated in a loving kind of way. We judge them as not worthy of love. And in the second part of verse 11, James says slander is even more evil than just withholding love from others. When he says we, when we slander, we judge the law and are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. Slander says God's law of love, it's conditional. Slander says we don't have to obey God's law of love. So to slander and to refuse love to others means that we're judging God's law as negotiable. But that's not true. God's law of love is binding and it's always in effect. God's laws are never conditional or negotiable. And we take God's place when we judge when to apply his law of love or not to apply it. We take God's place when we judge who should be loved and who should not be loved. Remember, Jesus even said, love your enemy. This sin of slander, it takes us back, right back to the Garden of Eden. In their pride, Adam and Eve took God's place as judge, and what happened? All hell broke loose. Prideful slander keeps hell breaking loose in the family of Jesus Christ. We do not have the right or the authority to judge when or who to love or not. God is judge, not us. As I said before we read the passages, James is not the only New Testament teacher to warn against judging others. We learn this important lesson from the greatest teacher. We learned it from his brother and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the portion we read from Matthew 7 is just a section of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and he's warning us, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And so if we judge other people not worthy of our love, we will be judged unworthy of God's love. If we judge others as less than us, less than human, we will be judged less than human as well, and Christ only saves humans. Jesus Christ is the world's judge. What's that line in the Apostles' Creed? Jesus Christ will come to judge the living and the dead. If we judge others not worthy of the love of God, that God commands us to show them Jesus Christ will judge us, not worthy of his love. And without Christ's love applied in our lives, we have a huge problem. 
And that huge problem is our sin and its consequences, physical and spiritual death. The love of Jesus Christ led him to the cross. Think of Philippians 2 again. Think of the song we just sang. Christ's love applied to us, that provides the forgiveness of, from sin. It provides victory over death. Christ's love led him to become human and live and die in our place. If Jesus withholds his love from us, then we are doomed. In his sermon about not judging others, Jesus talks about specks and planks in eyes. Matthew 7, verse 3, you point out the speck in your brother's eye, but ignore the plank in your own eye. Specks and planks, he's talking about our sins, our faults. If we go around pointing out the faults of others, we are likely slandering them. Pointing out specks in people's eyes to other people is not about getting the speck out. No, we point the specks out in people's eyes to other people in order to knock that person down. That's slander. That's gossip at work. And love is not at work when we treat and talk about other people in this way. But again, it's worse than that, according to the second part of Matthew 7, verse 3, when Jesus says, but you ignore the plank in your own eye. Focusing on the sins of others, it's a good way that we use to excuse our own gross sins. But ignoring our sin, that's not loving ourselves and it's hypocritical. If we're honest, wanting to avoid sin is often why we go around pointing out the sins of others. We highlight their sins, their faults, so that our sins can be ignored and be made to look less severe. But excusing our own sin, it's not loving ourselves and it's also, in effect, damning ourselves. Submitting to God and His law of love means we let Jesus Christ be judge and not us. Submitting means loving God and loving others like ourselves. We have to be very careful in how we speak <clears throat> about other Christians because it's very easy and very tempting to go around pointing out the faults of others. God makes clear throughout His Bible we are not to slander other people. Now, we should be clear also on what James and Jesus and James are not teaching, what they do not mean about judging and pointing out sin. As I said, we are not to excuse sin. And James and Jesus are not teaching that we can just pretend sin isn't happening. We don't go around doing that. First, in our own lives, we don't pretend it's not there, sin. And second, in the lives of others. As I said, loving ourselves does not mean that we accept and tolerate our sin in verse 8, James talks about fleeing sin. He says, wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Talking about reconciling the growth of being redeemed and sanctified in Christ. And Jesus says we are to first take the plank of sin out of our own eye. So loving ourselves means that we're honest with ourselves about all of our sins. And again, it takes humility and submission to be honest about our sin. But it's in that honest humility when we go to God, we seek His mercy and grace, and we will find it. He will give it to us. For only in God, through Jesus Christ, and the faith that He gives us, does He deal with our sin. And so we love ourselves when we repent of that sin, when we take that sin to the cross and leave it there. And loving others, that means we do not accept and do not tolerate their sins either. As I said, slander is pointing out the sins of Christian A to Christian B behind Christian A's back. Loving Christian A means we go to that person. We point out their sin to them, not others. Hear Jesus in Matthew 18, 15, if, you, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. you don't go around broadcasting people's sins. Reconciliation doesn't help that in that. When we go to a fellow Christian in love and show them their faults, their sin, it needs to be about reconciliation. Love for others says, I don't want their sin to stand between me and them. And most importantly, love for others means we don't want their sin to stand between them and God. 
So when we go to another Christian in love to point out their sin, we also need to remind them of who can forgive that sin. Again, we point them to Jesus Christ. For we all need our eyes fixed on Jesus in order to become like Him. Directing ourselves and others to Jesus, that is God's law of love in action. There's nothing more loving than pointing a sinner to Jesus Christ. Because when a sinner meets Jesus and turns from their sin, they find forgiveness and salvation and eternal life. God's goal for all those He's given faith. So let's be helping the Lord God in this mission as He calls us to, to tell others about Jesus, His wonderful love, and His blood shed for us that forgives us of all our sin. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, James has brought another difficult topic before us. The words we use when we slander other people. How we use our mouths to cut other people down, set their lives on fire, to harm them. We talked about all the different reasons why we do that. Because we feel small and we try to build ourselves up. Because we're trying to hide sin in our lives by exposing other people's sin. Lord, whatever the motives are to slander someone, take those motives out of our heart. And of course, that means we need a right relationship with you. We need to live in your grace and your mercy and never leave that. For then we think, if we do leave your grace and mercy, we think we've accomplished good on our own, that we're growing in faith on our own, that somehow our works are making us better. So keep us in right relationship with you and with Jesus Christ to realize that it is by grace we have been saved through faith and it's not of our own, it's a gift from you. <clears throat> and because it's all from you, a gift, that should raise up within our hearts an overwhelming flood of gratitude for the love that Jesus Christ has for us. And out of that gratitude, <clears throat> Lord, send us then to our brothers and sisters in the Lord to point out where they're going wrong so that hopefully... We can point them to Jesus and they will accept that uh, correction, that conviction. Sometimes you convict us, Holy Spirit, through your voice and sometimes you convict us through the voice of those around us. May we not be arrogant or hard-hearted or pig-headed to ignore you speaking to us through whatever means because the goal you have for us as your children is to become like Jesus Christ, as we've been talking about for many weeks now. And so make that happen, we pray. Make us humble. Give us spirits of humility and submission to you, first of all, that we may live your laws of love, to put you number one, and to treat our neighbors like ourselves. And of course, as we just said, there's nothing more loving than pointing someone to Jesus Christ, and we can do that in our own lives, and we need to do that as well as our neighbors. So help us to do that, that we may live in the love you have shown us in our Savior. We pray in His name. Amen. Our song of response, Teach Me, O Lord, Your Way of Truth, reminds us that we need to keep going back to God's Word. Of course, Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh. We find true human living when we look at Jesus, so I picked this song as a reminder that we need to keep being grounded in God and His Word and in the Savior Jesus Christ. So let's stand together and sing, Teach Me, O Lord, Your Way of Truth.
Turn to God again in prayer and offer our joys and concerns, the things that are on our hearts to Him and trust that our God hears us. Our Heavenly Father knows what's best for His children and will give to us what He deems best in His time and according to His will. Let's pray. Our great and gracious God, You have called us to this place to this time of worshiping you and wherever we are, we thank you. We can take this time to be grounded in, in you, in who you are and who you want us to be in your word. We thank you, Lord, that you seek to teach us your way of truth and we pray that our hearts may be open to accept that truth. Sometimes it's painful to hear what you have to say to us. You expose who we are and who we need to be and aren't living like. Through your servant, James, Lord, we've touched on many difficult topics that have probably hit a chord, a nerve in each one of us. And we pray, Lord, that we would not see your conviction as judgment, but as your invitation to grow closer to you in relationship and in love, and grow closer to Jesus. Lord, we are so grateful to know you and to be your children, for apart from you there is death, there is chaos, apart from you there is hell. We thank you, Lord, for calling us into your family, and we thank you you've called us to live together under one Lord, one faith, one rebirth in Jesus. May that one Lord, one faith one sanctification draws us closer in unity and in purpose that we may live for you, triune God, the God who exists in perfect unity. We thank you for your promises to us, the many promises you've already fulfilled, the promises that you will fulfill in Jesus Christ when he returns and completes your great redemption plan. You are the ever faithful Lord and we praise you for your faithfulness. We thank you for giving us a Savior. We thank you for giving us your Spirit who lives in all who confess Christ as Lord. It is through your work and in Jesus that we are receiving saving faith and the goal of our salvation, which is to become like Christ. In Jesus we find justification, we find true peace, joy, and hope. May we ever be grateful for all that you have given to us and you have done for us and continue to do day by day for us. Produce in us, Lord, a deep well of gratitude in heart and soul. Help us, Lord, to be faithful in teaching the next generations of your great and glorious deeds and your love. That will require us being faithful as students of your word as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. So help us, each one, personally to do that so we can be a good example to those around us, in our families, in this church community. Lord, in the response to the mercy and grace that you give us to deal with our sin and for your salvation that we have in, through faith in Jesus, help us to live lives of service to you, to be good and kind to our neighbors within the church and outside, to help those in need, you were reminded of on Thanksgiving Day that you give us physical bread and you give us the bread of heaven. We are to share these with those in need. You are merciful, Lord, and you are faithful beyond our understanding. We've already talked about our sins and finding forgiveness in you, and we, fo we fail to forgive others. And yet you sent your Son to save us, so 
Help us to live lives of mercy and grace like Him. We pray for those who have been hurt, those who struggle with forgiving others, those who are dealing with hate in their hearts, perhaps even consumed by that hate and anger towards others. Let them see, Lord, that it's only destroying them and not the person who's probably moved on or isn't even alive anymore. So it's for our own good that you say we need to forgive others. Lord, we pray for those wrestling with illness, physical, mental, spiritual illness, Lord, those who are seeking after the gods of this world, bring them back or bring them to faith in Jesus for the first time. We pray that you would give peace to those who are upset in mind and soul. You would give them light and comfort. If they're feeling cold, Lord, and disenfranchised, bring them into your presence. They may bask in your loving presence. And be with those who are ill in whatever way, but be your will. Give them healing, Lord, recovery from surgery, recovery from ailing bodies. We pray, Lord, that if it is not your will, that you give them strength to journey through their illnesses, through their sicknesses, Lord. We pray for those whose days are, are becoming few. We all have to face that final enemy, Lord, and some are closer to that than, than others, and we just pray that you be near them. Prepare them, Lord, for that transition. For those in Jesus Christ who have faith in him, whose trust is in him, death is just a doorway into your presence. So we need not fear it if Christ is our Savior. We don't look forward to it necessarily, but we don't need to fear it, for we go to be with you in spirit. And we live in spirit with you until you return, Lord Jesus, and give us our resurrection bodies. And so may our thoughts be on that, that we would realize that this world is not our home, this life is not our one and only life, there's a life to come. And if we're in, in, your, in your family through faith in Christ, it's eternal life in your new kingdom. May that give us hope each and every day for the struggles and the trials and temptations that we face that Jesus is our Lord and he'll never let us go. So hear all our prayers, Lord, the things that are on our hearts that aren't mentioned out loud at this time. Give us the assurance, Lord, that you know what we're troubled with, what we're dealing with. And may we leave our concerns, our prayer requests at your throne and trust that you will answer them. Go with us now in the rest of this service and in this day and in the week that lies ahead. In all we do, help us to live for you for your honor and your glory, spreading the love and the good news of Jesus all around us. We pray this all in his name. Amen. <clears throat> in a moment, the deacons will collect an offering for the Lethbridge Pregnancy Care Center. You can give by giving money into the collection plates, or you can do that electronically through, uh, through us as a church or directly with the Pregnancy Care Center. They'll gladly accept your donations to help people who are dealing with unplanned pregnancies, especially pregnant women who don't know where to turn. May God bless this uh, care center and this agency, this mission that seeks to honor and protect life. And while the plates are going around, we'll remain seated and we'll sing, Oh, how good it is.
pray. Dear Lord, we have, you have given us so much that we often take many blessings for granted. We are grateful for our houses and families and for places like Lethbridge Pregnancy Center, which provides pregnant women with safe, secure shelter, love and support and encouragement. This nonprofit Christian ministry has helped women in need over the years and depends on your donations. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Following the service, please gather in the hall if you're able and enjoy some fellowship together, some refreshment. Before we sing in Christ alone, receive God's parting benediction. May your love abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Jesus Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. To the glory and to the praise of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>